Hello, my name is Julie McCrossan. Welcome to this series of conversations with people who are working to improve access to clinical trials for everyone in our community. And this series is hosted by the GI Cancer Institute. In this episode, Madison Shakespeare, a Gadigal traditional owner and community advisory panel member with the GI Cancer Institute, AGITG, explains why cultural protocol training is an essential first step for all members of clinical trials teams and why deep listening is the key. Just explain deep listening and how you would like um, non-Aboriginal uh, clinicians, uh, nurses, allied health doctors, to understand deep listening and to engage in it with First Nations patients. Deep listening means many things for First Nations people. Let me say, speaking about clinical trials, when I speak of deep listening in this context, it's listening to what your patient wants rather than what perhaps at a clinical level they may need because then must be a fundamental understanding of holistic well-being. As patient recovery is not just about physical, realising physical outcomes. Mm -hmm. it, it's about aligning cultural, spiritual and physical wellness and out outcomes, positive outcomes. And so often, certainly I've seen exemplary healthcare professionals fighting on a daily basis it's their vocation to find treatment options and, and life outcomes um, and indeed quality of life outcomes. But from a First Nation perspective, that must be realised in cultural and spiritual terms as well. I want to turn to the issue that many of the clinicians watching this, multidisciplinary clinicians, will be working in cities or very large regional centres and they may not realise who are their First Nations patients. They may not realise the person is Aboriginal, but that person may deeply identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander and be very involved with their kith, their kin and their community. So what is your message to health practitioners about finding out how the patient views themselves and whether they are indeed First Nations people? Certainly, and I'm going to use a very crude example, but the ticker box um, option that is so often put in forms in terms of the self-identification option that in patient forms is inadequate. And we go back to deep listening. By having cultural training and by sitting in a space and yarning with patients about what their healthcare needs and outcomes are, are really foundationary ways to learn how a patient understands their existence, how important community and kin are, aspects of um, procedures, what may be daunting for that patient. And certainly coming from an, a well-informed background, which, which can be developed through cultural training, will enlighten practitioners more. It's certainly not a question of sitting there and asking patients to identify. It's a really daunting and, and quite a hideous process at times. There are other times where patients will freely um, want to offer cultural background, but it is up to the patient. So again, as I said, it, it comes back to that really active listening and an open-ended questioning and that 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 can be really difficult because you know consultations are often very short and there's a long a long list of patients waiting to see healthcare specialists but by being aware and as it, I'll go back to the training again training can help practitioners be aware of certain aspects that to look out for, to listen, listen for. And yeah, that, that can bring together a beautiful, you know, sort of working professional relationship of, of not only patient focused care, but of culturally safe, um, you know, wellbeing outcomes for patients. Before we close, Madison, uh, I, I understand that you, you lost your own partner to cancer. Um, 
Is that the motivation for your ongoing advocacy for other patients, other families, and, and for First Nations communities? Is, is that the driving force of still being involved? Well, I think that perhaps my journey started well before uh, my, my partner uh, unexpectedly was diagnosed. I was four years of age when my mum first became ill. And for many years, she was she was undiagnosed. And she herself was a remarkable healthcare practitioner. She was a bush nurse. She was a Karatani mothercraft nurse, cared for tens of thousands of babies all of her life, and yet couldn't, couldn't even get a diagnosis, let alone access to treatment. So and what was the diagnosis ultimately? So ultimately, she lived with chronic neutrophilic leukemia for about, about they think about 12 years. But then um, in the early 80s, because she was receiving so many blood infusions, um, they, they think she ended up contracting HIV. And it was certainly at the time when blood wasn't being tested. So, yeah, she ended up passing when I was 14. And it it's enough to really motivate one to to use one's one's skills for good. So I think that's perhaps when some of some of my advocacy began, and um, a focus on quality of life and keeping family together, but also really exceptional healthcare outcomes for for all people. Madison Shakespeare, thank you so much for doing this interview, for, for sharing your family story, your personal story, but also your expertise working uh, for First Nations cultural safety across the board, but particularly in health. It, it, we're just so grateful for your work. Thank you.